Thank you so much, Kathy. And um, thank you all for coming and uh, joining us this evening. I'm hoping we can have a productive session. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, you know, actually, Parminder and Kathy, actually, um, they, were, they invited um, uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, but he couldn't fill in, so I'm sort of filling in for him. <laughs> Small little joke. Um, so uh, I I'm try I'm to be positive. Uh, we have a whole bunch of attendees because from my standpoint, three is a crowd. So we have a crowd here. And again, all of you are very special and thank you for being with us tonight. I'm hoping we can again have some pointers and hopefully, you know, we, at the end of the session, I hope all of you won't um, be asleep. And if you did, at least, you know, get some good rest and a uh, little nap. Okay, anyway, on a heavier note, so, as we are trying to get back into the outdoors from this unfortunate pandemic, uh, finally we are seeing the light. And as we uh, step out of our doors, um, you know, and we're more active, you know, we're going to be talking about a topic which, you know, is all relative to us. Um, accidents happen to all of us, falls, motor vehicle collisions, and this brings us to the topic at hand, which is head and facial injuries and also neck injuries as well and hoping we can um, give you some insights into uh, some important details, some important knowledge on this topic, and also per, uh, perhaps some preventive measures as well. So as I mentioned, an accident can happen to any, well, any of us, right? And some of us are more susceptible to injury than others. And there's a few things we can all do to prevent injury to ourselves and others. So this topic will be divided into about four major topics. Number one is moderate to severe traumatic brain injury, bad stuff, right? the bad head injuries. Number two are minor uh, traumatic brain injuries, i.e. concussions. Then we're gonna talk uh, briefly about facial injuries, which really encompass lacerations. And then we'll talk about neck injuries as well. I'm hoping we'll have enough time. That's also very relevant, a lot of overlapping areas as well. So in terms of traumatic brain injury, okay, this is basically, um, you know, uh, a leading cause of death and disability. Um, in 2013, close to two and a half million people uh, went to the emergency room for a brain injury. And of those, about half a million or a quarter of a million were hospitalized and of those 50,000 actually died. And for those survivors, we're left with significant permanent disabilities. But this is a very important topic. And unfortunately, you know, a high amount of morbidity and mortality, um, serious disability for those who do survive. And furthermore, a significant economic burden as well. I mean, approximately $75 billion of loss in terms of economics. And again, you can't put a price tag on a lasting injury or of course the life of someone as well. And not only that, the milder traumatic brain injuries, which is actually a concussion, those can also have sequelae as well, and they're also gaining the media spotlight as well. We've had a movie on a CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, regarding football players, and this is this is uh, you know this is um, this is a thing. You know, this is a thing. It's not just something which is in the media. This is not just something which is um, uh, false or just exaggerated. But this definitely CTE is definitely a thing. So we should all be aware of that. And fortunately, as you see now, I mean, if you're a football player, you'll see what's going on. Every time there is a suspected head injury, the player is evaluated, which they should be. And this is something which should be more routine in those sports, in those um, uh, contexts where uh, more likely to have a head injury. So um, whoever's in sports, whoever's a coach, um, athlete, they should also be um, more aware of head injury, particularly for, you know, relative to concussion. So going forward, in terms of the epidemiology of head injury, okay, as we mentioned, um, greater than a million sustain a brain injury yearly, okay. But fortunately, most are mild. However, the incidence altogether of mild traumatic brain injury is underreported because much of the time it's not recognized, right? The, the person who is concussed, they're not going to say, "Oh, I have a concussion." No, they're going to be out. They may, uh, they're going to have some uh, problems with memory before, during, or after, or altogether of the incident. And sometimes it may be mild. Uh, altogether, in terms of causes of head injury, number one are falls. And that's what I see. I mean, I see uh, the patients who are geriatric, who have problems with gait. They're already like walking with a walker. They're more um, uh, likely predilection to fall. And often just the fact that there are elderly, it's actually even higher risk 
um, to uh, sustain a serious uh, brain injury. And then we have number two, motor vehicle collisions. Um, you know, uh, serious motor vehicle collisions also are a relatively common cause of head injury as well. Then we have occupational accidents, those who are in construction, you know, there's obviously they're dealing with heavy machinery, uh, heavy things, and an accident can be bad. Uh, then we have, um, of course, uh, athletes, um, sports such as football, extremely high risk of head injury, but other things as well, such as rugby, boxing, even soccer. And then, of course, don't we can't forget about assaults as well, which is, um, you know, common causes as well. And um, again, some are more prone to head injury than others. So a uh, very strong risk factor are the adults. And this is where the fall is the most common co uh, cause of the head injury, the fall, or even the neck injury, versus youngsters or young, uh, where it's often the motor vehicle collision or it's often um, some type of, um, uh, you know, like sports or biking or those type of activities which cause the injury. So, um, as I mentioned, in terms of mild traumatic brain injury, the number one sport which is implicated this um, is actually football. Okay, it's the number one sport by far. And um, in terms of just high school athletes alone, high, high school football players, they're actually uh, estimate to be 20% of them have a concussion yearly. So that's huge. And you know, well, what about those who go on to college about similar or maybe 10%. And so it's, a, you know, a, a repeated concussions can have, uh, there are implicated in um, uh, progression to or possibly a link with chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So it is a big deal, you know, a repeated concussions. And of course, other activities as well, not just football, you have rugby, you have, um, you know, sports such as ice hockey, soccer, um, uh, you know, things such as snowboarding, skis, obviously, those are obviously high risk, particularly, you know, when you're going at a higher velocity. Myself, I mean, I've seen a couple of my colleagues who've been involved in um, a couple of bike accidents who had a concussion. Both of them were wearing a helmet. So these are um, high risk activities. We all have to be cognizant and not just about wearing a helmet, but just be a little more aware and uh, protect yourself, protect your others, stay away from, you know, alcohol, anything which um, can impair us and um, you know, be, be, be vigilant. And um, so the annual incidence of a concussion in the US uh, is close to 4 million. So that's, so that's big, you know? And depending on the sport, could be up to 20% of the athletes may sustain a concussion per year. So it's important that, you know, sports teams, uh, uh, coaches, they be versed in knowing uh, the warning signs of a concussion or a head injury. It's also actually a common uh, injury in soldiers, you know, over there who are exposed to shrapnel blast injuries, who just in combat training can sustain uh, head injury. Other risk factors, uh, being a male, again, there's a more increased risk uh, behavior noted, you know, sometimes they just don't know better, better than the average 40-year-old. Uh, um, there's also um, those who have lower cognitive function, uh, some from group homes are more likely because of just behavior issues. And alcoholism is very big as well. Even just drinking one drink or, um, you know, like having several drinks can actually shrink a bare brain and increase the chance of bleeding, particularly in the setting of trauma. And, you know, the person who's impaired, they're not gonna have the symptoms of a headache. They're not gonna, they're gonna think everything's okay. Well, they may have serious injuries as well. And not only that, what about those who are involved in DWI? What about those who are involved in trauma? I mean, it's a big um, cause of, of you know, uh, death and you know, um, injury and problems to society as well. Well, those are all things we can do in terms of uh, protecting ourselves, protecting others as well. Sobriety, wearing helmets, wearing seatbelts, it goes a long way to protecting us um, and also others as well. For training to kids, children, um, the, Head injuries are usually caused, unfortunately, by trauma, such as from violence, unfortunately, gunshot wounds, uh, child abuse, shaken baby syndrome. But those who are under two years old, they have a little more higher risk of head injury just because of the fact that the brain, the, the cranium has not solidified yet you know, into the skull, but they're more apt uh, and likely to sustain an injury. So those who are under two years old, uh, you have to have a high vigilance, particularly in that uh, setting where they have had a fall and there's a, a, a suspicion that they may have hit their head um, or hit it hard. So going forward, um, in terms of 
concussion. What do we see on CAT scan? So actually a concussion, a mild traumatic brain injury, the CAT scan is normal, okay, if it is chosen to be done. And the American Association of Neurologists, and these are like the smartest doctors, I consider the neurologists to be the smartest doctors. Um, and they define concussion as a trauma-induced alteration in mental status, i.e., uh, there's a deceleration, acceleration of the brain from the impact, and it shakes the brain to the point where uh, the person gets, gets confused, or there's impairment, impairment in memory, specifically fine cognition, fine cognition. They may know that they're in the month of June, that their name is Joe or Jane, or what the year is, uh, but or how old they are, but they may not know exactly what happened during, before, after the event, or what they had for lunch or dinner. So those fine things are important in terms of um, ascertaining or defining a, a possible concussion. But in general, um, a concussion is uh, defined by three things. Number one, any period of a blackout, right? So there's a head injury and there's a blackout. And that's common, but not as common as number one, where there's a memory impairment. And that can be subtle. So you may not have a, you can have a football player, uh, no one may know what happened, but they're just not acting right. They're repeating themselves or they're foggy. This should be a, you know, alert for the coaches or the um, other pl players that this, uh, that something's not right and they need to be, um, uh, you know, assessed for a possible head injury. And of course, for us uh, doctors, you have the glass coma scale of 13 or more. Basically, that means that someone who's confused confused, who may not uh, be able to have, have having problems with in terms of following command or opening their eyes or in terms of speech, um, subtle or big. So pathophysiology at the neuronal level, at the cell level, what happens with that concussion? So again, we're talking about minor head injury, not major head injury where there's a bleed in the brain. Now, this is basically where there the CAT scan, if it is done, you know, if you have the x-ray vision, it's normal. But what you see is basically there's a jolt and the nerves are shaken up and there's a physiologic disruption of function. Okay. And this again happens from that contact, from that head injury. Okay. And this result in some pathology, there's results in mild nerve damage, not significant nerve damage because it's not seen or ascertained on that imaging modality, but it's there and you could see it if the practitioner, if that sports medicine coach, if that physician or emergency uh, physician assistant does that assessment and, this, and, and, and determines, wait a second, um, Bob is not able to spell the word world backwards. He's not able to count backwards from 20. This involves you know, a little advanced cognition. Okay. He may be able to know who he is and what happened uh, or some details about what's going on. Oh, yeah, I'm in the hospital, of course. But the uh, practitioner, um, the medical specialist, the physician, they should really do a more thorough assessment, not just a very superficial exam. Uh, this, th th otherwise, the concussion diagnosis will be missed. So uh, when the CAT scan shows abnormalities, that means that there is moderate to severe brain injury and the person needs to be in the ICU not just in the ER, not just in the ambulance, he needs to be in the, or he, she needs to be in the ICU because they are already at very high risk for mortality or morbidity. Again, if there is, if it's a mild thing, or there's someone who's just shooken up a little bit, a little foggy, you know, they didn't black out, they, you probably, you may not need to, you know, call the ambulance, we just need to be assessed and they may need to, yes, go to the emergency room, but it doesn't have to be perhaps that urgent or emergent. Uh, maybe you know in an hour or two, or maybe um, in a few hours, depending on how significant is the assessment. Okay, so and when you have when you talk about moderate or severe traumatic brain injury, actually that's when you have neuronal damage. That's when you have brain damage. Okay, and this is from the just number one, the shear, right? The acceleration deceleration. You have a, a jolt to the brain. And then this is going to cause some bleeding, and this leads to you know like a series of events. So when you have bleeding, then it leads to more swelling and damage to the brain. This leads perhaps to more death and injury to the brain. You can have low blood pressure again, adding to more brain damage. You can have low oxygen because of the whole incident that they're not breathing properly. Again, this is why they need to uh, this ushered really uh, emergently 
to the emergency room and also to the ICU because a lot of badness is happening. That's typically more obvious. I mean, patients who are people who have sustained a bad head injury, they're, they, they're, they're typically in, where they need to be, you know, in the ambulance or in the emergency room or on their way to the ICU. But again, the subtleties, that's, that's where we, you know, we sort of like, um, that's where we have to do, make that decision. Okay, who needs to go to the emergency room? Who needs to be assessed for possible concussion? And the, ca the caveat with, you know, concussion or possible concussion um, or concussive injury is that you do not have to black out for a concussion to occur. In fact, the majority of concussions in sports occur without loss of consciousness. They're often unrecognized, okay? And this can be a dilemma, obviously. Like, just a reflection for myself, like when I, way back when, when I was a teenager, uh, I lived in the Bronx, right? And um, we used to play at Clinton High School. It used to have a very nice turf field. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with Clinton High School, but it is, it's up there in terms of being uh, a top high school. Um, so a top high school in terms of number one or number two most dangerous high school in the U.S., believe it or not. I didn't attend Clinton High School. I didn't have the honor. I went to Brooklyn Technical. Uh, so I had to like commute through, through three boroughs to get there. Um, but they, they had a nice turf. Anyway, we were playing football, tackle football. Uh, without a helmet, of course, you know, teenagers. And uh, after the game, one of our friends, Khalid, I mean, basically kept on repeating himself, like, okay, what's going on? Uh, is, is you just trying to be funny? But then it became pretty uh, obvious that something's wrong. And when he kept on calling again after every five minutes, what happened? What's going on? Where was I? Where were you? Um, can you tell me about what just happened? So he obviously had a concussion. None of us recognized that. Uh, fortunately, he ended up doing fine, but perhaps he should have been you know, evaluated the emergency room. We didn't know any better. But this is exactly how majority of concussions occur. You don't have a specific incident of head injury. You, you have a person who looks okay, but they're just a little off. And then sometimes the symptoms occur after the accident or the apparent accident, maybe half an hour, maybe an hour. Um, so this is basically a concussion. This is a typical, and the only way really that someone can um, diagnose that is to do detailed testing. And this encompasses two things. Number one, a thorough neurologic exam. And that's just to make sure that they're not having a traumatic, a severe traumatic brain injury, like bleeding in the brain. Number two, um, are they really having a concussion? And that would be, um, again, ascertained with um, you know, more final cognitive testing, not just asking their name, but asking things which would involve a higher cognitive function, as I mentioned, you know, spelling some word backwards or counting backwards as well. But so other symptoms of a concussion, again, depending on the person, right, it could be different, some type of disorientation, some type of confusion, particularly with amnesia, particularly with memory, right? So memory previously, uh, retrograde amnesia, um, blackouts as, there, as things were happening or uh, blackouts um, anterograde, as, uh, you know, as, as they're going, they're still not remembering what's going on. And this can obviously be manifest with repeat questioning and disorientation, um, being a little more emotional than they're, they're uh, recognized to be, okay? Um, in terms of also slurred speech as well. Other symptoms, and of course, um, in general, the the neuro exam, aside from maybe gait instability and steady gait, for the most part, they don't manifest weakness um, or like, you know, like they're bla a blackout in terms of vision, you know. Um, other symptoms of a concussion are severe or moderate headache, again, a red flag. Um, dizziness or imbalance, another red flag. Uh, vomiting, another red flag. Sometimes they can even have a seizure, which I've seen as well with a concussion. Um, why are they a red flag? Well, these symptoms can also be, or commonly associated with a moderate to severe head injury. So we have to also look for warning signs as well. Yes, you know, Joe may be having a concussion after the ball game, um, the football game, but something bad can be happening and they need to be um, assessed emergently in the emergency setting if they have those other signs. Uh, so, you know, for those patients who uh, okay, so let's go forward. Okay, so again, the question is, the be that begs to be asked is, is there a need to be evaluated? And this is where um, uh, those who are on the front lines in the game, such as the coach, 
other athletes, um, they make that determination. It's it's up to them, you know. Like, okay, does is is Joe fine, or he just he's okay, um, you know? And it depends. They, if they're not evaluated thoroughly, then it could be that that injury could be missed. Okay, so it's not just that alone, though. There are other several other factors which go into assessment of a head injury. Again, not all of us are playing tackle football on, you know, or um, you know, riding a bike and um, having a fall, right? It's just most of us just have a trip and they bang, we bang our heads on the wall. Um, and, um, you know, we fell and obviously we're, we're, we're sort of like uh, jolted for a few seconds. Right, we may have thought we blacked out, but it was really a second or two, and it appears to be like half a minute or so. But the question is, do we uh, do we need to be evaluated? Does um, you know do our does our family member need to be evaluated? Well, it depends on several factors from the medical standpoint. Number one is mechanism. Okay, is the, was the mechanism significant? Was it just a mild trip and fall on a carpet which is padded, or was it down a flight of stairs? Was it just a little fender bender where there was no head impaction, or was there a head-on collision? Was there someone um, who on a motorcycle without a helmet, or was it just you know some someone who just um, you know, a little trip? and didn't pass that and feel they feel okay. So mechanism is very important. Number two is blood thinners. As we have an aging society, right? Um, so many great percentage of patients who are above 80 years old or even 70 now are on really strong blood thinners. In fact, it's so easy now to be on a blood thinner. You don't even need to have blood work anymore. You don't have to, if you don't, you know, now we have so many other agents which are replacing Coumadin, such as Apix, Apixamab, uh, we have Zeralto, Rivaroxabam, uh, other, um, novel anticoagulants which do not need monitoring and these are you know these are pretty potent and they're just, they're basically like you know warfarin and there's others which are uh, those who have had a heart attack and cardiac stents um, such as um, uh, clopidogrel or plavix those are also very strong blood thinners so that's also a very important factor because if you had a decent head injury even though they don't you know, feel fine but they're on blood thinners then they're automatically they're at high risk for some serious pathology also age, also age is a very important factor as well. So as you age, as we age, and all of us are aging, but after 60, particularly like 70, 80, the brain shrinks. Or there is a little bit of atrophy, like it or not. And what that does when you have atrophy, when there's more space uh, between the brain and the skull, is that there are veins there which can easily be um, uh, caused to be bleeding and shear from a fall or heart impaction. So it's easier to bleed just from that, even if the, the person who is a little elderly is not on blood thinners and is you know, uh, healthy. So age in and of itself is a risk factor. And of course, the context, what happens in terms of their stat. Are they, are they how long did they black out for? Was it a couple of seconds, which for me really is not really a true blackout or like, you know, several minutes where they were unconscious, were they having a seizure? Was a, were, were they clenching their jaw or their eyes flickering like a seizure possibly? And are they still like, you know, um, um, uh, confused? Okay, so those things going to, that evaluation, do they need a CAT scan? CAT scan is an extremely sensitive mortality, not an MRI, not an X-ray of the skull, a CAT scan, that's the question. And if any of these um, uh, patients or whoever has, a, has sustained a head injury and has that um, high risk, then of course they should get a stat CAT scan. But not everyone needs a CAT scan and this is not a benign modality. A CAT scan is not benign. I mean, um, yes, the technology is helping us to have CAT scans with thinner slices, less radiation, but it is, you know, like 100 to 200 x-rays. And there is an additive effect of increased you know, risk of cancer. Uh, one, one CAT scan is not going to cause cancer, but many, many over you know, a lifetime can put someone at risk. Particularly, like, for example, a nursery CAT scan on a young woman puts her actually at more risk than a guy because it's sort of uh, the radiation catches a thyroid and they're a little more susceptible. So you have to, you know, be caught as as physician, you have to, we have to be cognizant and doing something, um, you know, doing something which is uh, not causing harm. Again, it's all benefits versus harm because not everyone who has a headache in the context of a possible accident and whatnot needs a CAT scan. It depends on combination of factors, risk factors. So if a person who has a, uh, involved in a fender bender um, where the dump bumper was a damage, they were able to get out of the car and uh, they were okay initially, no symptoms, and they developed a mild headache, which is to be expected, I'm not going to cast scan that person. But I would, perhaps, if they're 90 years old on Coumadin and they may have, uh, uh, you know, banged their uh, head against the steering wheel, even though they feel fine. 
or they had a trip and fall and they feel fine, they uh, bang their head against you know, some, some hard, con hard, hard surface. Again, it depends on the context, depends on the context. Um, so as you mentioned, blood thinners, uh, any type of neurologic change, right? Altered mental status, any type of deficits, blurry vision, vomiting seizures, red flags already, a bad mechanism, right? And age, all these things are um, important risk factors. For children, again, I mentioned, if you remember, anyone who's under two years old, they're at higher risk for a head injury. And obviously, um, you know, a toddler's not gonna be able to tell me, okay, is your headache a little bit or really that bad? I mean, they're obviously, so this is where you have to have a higher suspicion and be um, more vigilant in perhaps getting that CAT scan. And of course, sobriety is very important. So if the patient is intoxicated, uh, any type of energy, I, I and my colleagues will CAT scan because it's really, they, the history is really uh, very limited and they're not going to be able to tell me much. Yes, they're going to feel nice and um, jovial, but I'm not sure what, and they can be just like that with bleeding in the brain, which all of us have seen. Um, uh, it's, it's a frequent occurrence, unfortunately, in the, the patient who's intoxicated in the uh, face of trauma, head trauma. So prevention is better than cure. Okay, helmets, seed beds, sobriety, um, another um, shout out for that. Now, going forward, I know that sort of you've already like, it's a lot of slides, I um, appreciate your patience. So just because the fact that this is a little more relevant to the, um, for athletes, for younger uh, folks who are now like getting back into the thick of things, you know, in the summer, uh, whether it be um, uh, football, soccer, uh, whatnot. So concussion screening um, should be done by a trained licensed health professional, an emergency physician um, or provider and or, or, and or sports medicine provider. And as I mentioned before, this typically involves a thorough neurologic assessment, right? And also a thorough mental status ass assessment, particularly tailored to, um, you know, a few cognitive tests. And actually there are screening modalities and screen assessments which are used and which are very helpful. The, the purpose for these, such as for example, the SAC, the standardized assessment of concussion. The reason why you use this is that in the thick of things when things are getting busy, if we're all imperfect and that list, right? That list, like for example, you have you have the NI stroke scale and all these different types of um, you know screening modalities for whatever medical issues, but the, the list allows us to be thorough in our assessment we, so we don't miss things, okay? And um, so that's, that's, that's why it's important. And even, even if you do a thorough, for example, SAC on a patient who has had possible concussion, its diagnostic accuracy is not 100%, it's actually 85%. So this is why we need to have someone who um, is experienced in concussion assessment or assessment of head injury, not just you know going through a little table and do a checkoff list. No, they also have to be um, have to have some type of experience and a knowledge beyond just a checklist as well. Again, neurologic exam. Uh, you don't have to be a neurologist to do a neuro exam, but you need to obviously have a decent amount of um, experience and practice in doing that and those questions as well and coming up with a um, assessment and plan. Okay, going forward. Um, I'm taking a breather, hopefully you're all as well. So as, as I mentioned before, CAT scan is extremely sensitive and also very specific to rule out badness in the brain, okay? And not every concussion needs a CAT scan, right? I mean, so like, uh, some, uh, you, they may be 10 years old with mommy, um, there may have been a head injury, maybe they were a little dazed after the soccer ball hit their head, but maybe John doesn't need a CAT scan because everything looks good, he's fine, he has no symptoms, um, so they, he may need, not need a CAT scan, but at least in terms of, you know, having someone there to make sure he doesn't have any other symptoms is important. So anyway, um, for those who have had a CAT scan and it's negative, that's good. But sometimes those patients have exaggerated symptoms or persistent symptoms. In fact, like just reflecting on this, I mean, vast majority of patients who have had, a, have had a negative CAT scan, they do fine and they can go home, even if they're on Coumadin, even if they are 99 years old, 
um, they they do fine. I mean, if if they there's nothing else going on, but sometimes if, they, if a person has persistent symptoms such as uh, continuous confusion, um, you know, vomiting, a seizure or two, then they should really be observed. Like uh, one of our colleagues actually um, um, in, in in the department a few years ago, he um, he he had a head injury, a concussion. But he was admitted because, I mean, I went in there a couple of times to check up on him and it was like, okay, they didn't remember anything what I said. Um, obviously he was having, um, you know, anterograde amnesia and it was persistent. And he actually ended up having, um, you know, some findings on the MRI and it was actually admitted. He did fine, thank God. But the point is that, you know, some patients with a negative CT scan do need to be admitted. It's not that common, but it does happen. And most do fine. Most do fine. I mean, um, it's 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 un unlikely anyone with like a normal or exam, and persistent headache, a little bit of nausea, a little days. Symptoms of a concussion can sometimes last for a few days to a week. Okay, and as opposed to concussions, you know, like just uh, maybe I just put this uh, slide in here just to um, change things up a little bit. Um, uh, but um, in terms of like uh, concussions, the symptoms can last for uh, sometimes up to a week or even longer. Okay, but most of them after 24 hours, people do fine. Now, trending to moderate to severe head injuries. So um, these patients are obviously they're very sick, high morbidity and mortality. Um, they're basically going to have uh, going to require ICU care, and sometimes even they may require surgery. Okay, they may need to be on medications to uh, stabilize their blood pressure. If they have like a fever, they may need to uh, be have their temperature uh, checked and also sugars monitored uh, very thoroughly. And for those with you know moderate severe brain injury, I mentioned I alluded to that their the primary goal as they are being transported before the ICU and there in the ICU is to make sure that their vital signs are optimal, that they don't have low blood pressure, their oxygen level is good because any of those insults can cause more further brain damage, okay? Um, so further, further uh, info or important points on severe traumatic brain injury. As we mentioned, um, they have a 30% risk of death. So these patients who have severe traumatic brain injury, i.e. bleeding, if you look over there, the brain, there's asymmetry there. There's a lot of swelling on the um, uh, right side of the brain. So this is obviously there's there's something bad going on in that brain, but this is a you know, severe traumatic brain injury, and these patients have a very high morbidity and mortality. Okay, not only that, that mortality follows them even up to 10 years after the insult. So even up to 10 years, the the risk of death is very high, uh, from various causes such as increased risk of stroke and seizures, and whatnot, a deep brain thrombosis, and those up to 15% who are discharged with a severe traumatic brain injury actually unfortunately are discharged in a vegetative state. So this is very grim. You know, those patients who many of them are a large percentage have significant, um, you know, debilitation to the point where they can't even um, wake up or communicate. However, still despite this, despite the grim prognosis of many, many, a good percentage do uh, end up having some form of independence despite some permanent neurological deficits. And they do have some independence in terms of their recovery. So there is a decent percentage also recover from that insult. Um, and so, you know, it, it's it, irrespective of a, a very high morbidity mortality. Now trending to concussion. Again, I'm switch going back and forth. So I hope you're not, you know, getting confused and <laughs> <laughs> getting concussion symptoms. But um, so going to discharge instructions. Okay, now for the person who's had a mild uh, traumatic brain injury, suppose they're in the emergency room, we did a CAT scan, it was normal. What do I tell them? What do I tell the family members? Well, again, uh, any symptom which is very severe, such as um, too much somnolence, they can't get, they can't wake up, or the uh, headaches are uh, debilitating or severe. Um, there is blurry vision, there's vomiting, um, there's any type of weakness or numbness, obviously those patients need to get reassessed as, um, as, uh, ASAP. However, many patients who have concussions will end up having a little bit of post-concussive syndrome. And sometimes we see that in the emergency room where you have a person who got evaluated, they got a CAT scan, their neuro exam is normal, they come back, they still have a normal neuro example, normal 
neuro exam, I mean, um, but they have, you know, persistent headaches, not terrible, terrible, but it's bad enough that they just can't function. They can't focus. They have dizziness. They're having difficult time walking properly or fast. Well, these patients typically have post-concussive syndrome. And I mean, it really, unless they have any other stark symptoms, they really don't need imaging because again, repeat CT scan, it really is not warranted unless there's any other ominous signs, you know, because um, they're still maintaining appropriate. They're not having any anterior or great amnesia currently. They're not having a seizure. So for those patients, for those who have had a concussion of any grade, which is mild or moderate, we recommend brain rest. What that means is basically no reading or writing, no TV, no texting, just brain rest. Um, just do nothing. Um, you know, for some, for obviously some, this is very distressing because, um, you know, most of us are workaholics, but, you know, those, the person who has post-concussive syndrome, they can't really do that. And they can't really do any activity because they're already warped. Their brain is still recovering from that jolt, it just needs the brain to rest and those neurons to reset. And that could take um, at least 24 hours. It may take a little longer as well. But um, those patients who have persistent symptoms for a few days, they should get reassessed by a neurologist, by the primary care physician to see if there's any other modality which needs to be done or any other assessment. But for the most part, avoid those activities, number one, that put them at risk for the concussions. This is particularly important with respect to athletes because when they go back on the field, if they have a mild concussion, then it could be bad because already they're setting themselves up for a repeat concussion. So, um, okay, so a minority of patients with concussion actually have post-concussive syndrome. Most do fine after 24 hours. The athlete, again, um, in one study of like about 3,000 uh, football players, right? Those with three concussions had a three times more risk of future concussion with respect to those who've had no concussion. So, uh, you know, it's a cumulative um, additive effect would puts those at more risk for brain injury. And then you have, of course, CTE, which no one wants, right? Don't put your risk at for CTE. Those who have had multiple concussions really should be screened, you know, and advised and consider retirement from that profession because now they're setting themselves up for encephalopathy. Like they may not necessarily have to have encephalopathy. Like if anyone remembers if uh, Rain Crabet, he was a star uh, wide receiver for the New York Jets. I used to watch him, he was awesome in the Jets Hall of Fame. But one thing he's developed as a result of multiple concussions, and if you've watched, if you're a Jets fan, I mean, he got hit hard, but he held, to the, held onto the ball. Um, he he is, he's has debilitating headaches as a result of you know, playing in the NFL, um, but he doesn't regret it. But this is just one of those things from repeat head injuries and repeat concussions. And we've heard obviously other athletes as well, various um, similar or other types of persistent uh, symptoms, which are you know as a result of concussions um, from uh, f from football or uh, the like. Anyway, so premature return by a symptomatic player places him or her at greater risk for subsequent concussion and cumulative brain injury. So it's very important that those patients, those people, those uh, those athletes, not return to the the, the field. Okay, I'm just going to sort of go a little fast, fast forward. Now I'm going to skip over some stuff which I think I already covered quickly. So um, if there's any issues with that or clarification, please hit me up with the Q&A session. But let's transition to the next topic because this was supposed to be head and facial injuries. And obviously this is this is basically part and parcel who we are, our face, right? So we wanna make sure our face remains uh, beaming and shining and um, uh, without any cuts or injury. So when do we do have a injury to the face like a laceration, when do we need stitches? When do we need to be assessed? Well. Most of us, I think it's common sense when we need, when the, when the laceration is gaping or big or open, really we should have it assessed because um, uh, a butterfly, you know, on top of a cut to the face really doesn't give it justice. It really needs to be uh, stitched together so that it can heal properly. A stitch actually uh, de uh, prevents a bad scar from happening. And that's, I mean, I, I, me and my colleagues, we, we can, we're more than adept at repairing lacerations. If you know, if anyone wants a plastic surgeon, they can always request that, it's no problem. 
but a plastic surgeon may be re re recommended if there is a gaping wound, if there is a dog bite, if it's a complex laceration of the face, particularly through the vermilion border to the lip, where now it could be a little more finesse. And um, if the uh, practitioner or the physician or uh, they're not adept or they're not comfortable with that one stitch, it can potentially cause a scar. But there are times when a uh, plastic surgeon is warranted, but for the most, most of the uh, lacerations to the face, it really doesn't, it doesn't really require the expertise of a plastic surgeon. Now for uh, a laceration of the scalp, right? You can see my scalp pretty well delineated. Um, that's basically gonna require a staple or staples. And that's actually preferred over stitches because the tensile strength of a staple is better. Okay, because scalp has different layers, it's, it's pretty thick. Um, other things uh, which are part of a laceration, which is a no barrier, is good wound care. Keep the uh, cut clean and dry, right? Cleanliness and a clean wound just allows for better healing, decreasing scarring. Get that life saving tetanus, it's nothing we, uh, anyone wants, right? Tetanus, fortunately, it's uh, I've never seen a case, I hope not to see a case. Um, and um, yeah, keep uh, avoid any excessive activity after the laceration. Apply the antibacterial ointment. Some people may need an antibiotic. Some may not. Uh, for the most part, lacerations, you know, they're pretty obvious. Who's going to come to the emergency room? Those which are gaping, which are which need a you know stitch or two. Um, okay. Now I'm going to sort of go forward next five minutes and go over neck injuries, which are also very common, particularly in um, car accidents, right? Um, it's very common. It's almost predictable to get neck pain after a motor vehicle collision, okay? So this is basically a whiplash injury for the vast majority, okay? Um, it's very rare to have a spinal cord injury, thank, uh, th thank God, uh, or a dislocated spine. I mean, unfortunately, I really don't recall the last time I saw that. That's like really bad trauma. Um, but sometimes a hernia disc can also be possible as well. Um, a hernia disc, uh, there's two causes of a hernia disc. One is chronic wear and tear, you know, chronic heavy loading, but the other is trauma, right? Acute trauma where the disc just basically, you know, uh, um, I don't have a picture, but basically uh, the cervical spine, you have seven spine bones in the neck, and between the spine, you have a piece of tissue, which is a disc. And inside there's like a little gel liquid. And that's the um, that's basically the disc. What happens with a herniated disc is that with the trauma, some of that gel in the fluid in the disc uh, squirts out and it irritates the nerve. And sometimes the, um, the fluid can be a lot. It can go on a nerve, cause a lot of pain to the arm, numbness to the arm, sometimes even weakness as well. So those type of symptoms obviously warrant imaging. But a typical like whiplash injury, for the most part, doesn't really require an X-ray or a CAT scan. Okay. Uh, spinal cord injury. I mean, the symptoms for the most uh, for the most part are pretty obvious: numbness, weakness, or mechanism. Okay. A young person who had, uh, has a fender bender, um, who uh, was able to get out of the car, um, they do not have a spinal cord injury. Okay, it's, um, and for the most part, a, a, a pretty um, um, good rule of thumb in terms of who has a whiplash, who has something more, is if you have a, if you're involved in a fender bender, right, and the jerk, not the guy who hit you, but the jerk of the whole accident caused you to, um, you know, the muscles to spasm. And right now you feel fine, you're able to get the car, get the license number, and you feel fine, okay, everything's good. And then as soon as you hit home, ouch, back and neck pain. Well, that's the, those, that's basically the spasm of the muscle in reaction to the reflex jerk, right? That's what the muscles do. They, they spasm, they contract. And sometimes it could be inflammation to the joint, to the ligament, which it connects bone to bone. Um, and this is where like we come in, perhaps if the pain's too debilitating or if you didn't take any ibuprofen or NSAIDs initially when the pain started, which I always recommend, because um, that can, help deflame things and prevent severe spasm. But basically um, the, uh, for, for whiplash injuries, um, right? Um, they, they again occur from this acceleration deceleration mechanism. And when there is um, initial no symptoms and
hand, um, there's not a, the mechanism is not significant. There's no numbness to the arms. There is was good mobility of the neck. Typically you won't need an X-ray. Um, there's, there's two different um, uh, screening modality tools, which we use as physicians or uh, emergency providers, which is the Nexus criteria. And also there's a Canadian C-spine rules. I mean, these rules have been studied on tens of thousands of patients and extremely sensitive. Uh, and they basically ascertain the need for, does the person need an X-ray or a CAT scan? Okay. But if you're basically grandma who is 95 years old, significant injury, uh, even if they're having no neck pain or symptoms, I would not hesitate and do the CAT scan um, because of, again, age. Age is a risk factor in and of itself, right? We have osteoporosis, it's easier to have a fracture, which can be subtle. But for the young person, the mechanism is mild in general, for the most part, uh, unless symptoms are significant, often we, many times you would, you may be surprised we won't recommend an X-ray or a, a imaging mortality because it's really clinically, uh, there's no need for that. Uh, but again, any type of ominous symptoms such as numbness, which is persistent, um, if there is pain at the time of the injury, if there is, you know, ex uh, the person had to be extracted out, if they were not wearing their seat belt, if they hit their head, if the windshield is damaged, um, if there's any motorcycle rider, if there's a pedestrian struck, those are high risk and they will get imaged. Um, okay. Let's see, been over that. One caveat actually, which is, which sort of like uh, is unfortunate for those who have whiplash. Actually, they've done a study. It's uh, surprising for me to know is that even though uh, whiplash is benign, sometimes or actually not uncommon that um, as much as 50% of adults can have some lasting mild pain in the neck up to even a year out. So um, the pain can last, you know, but the most important thing again, is the mechanism, is age, uh, is any risk factor, which um, uh, which is very important in terms of determining whether there needs to be any imaging. Prevention, again, uh, prevention is better than cure. Always wear a seat belt, wear protective equipment. Uh, for athletes, train, warm up. These these activities are there to protect you. Right, that's why we always warm up in sports to make sure the muscles are good and they can, if any type of uh, jolt, whatever, they can protect us, uh, our neck and our head and other uh, body parts during um, any type of um, uh, accident. Okay, Bo proper body mechanics, uh, um, you know, instead of basically um, pushing through despite severe pain, take it easy, go on the sidelines, you know, um, uh, listen to your body, right, when you have an injury. Um, these, these things all just allow us to prevent further injury. And again, for a neck, uh, neck pain um, or body aches after a minor wheel collision, I, I really advocate um, taking like a ibuprofen if it's not contraindicated or a leave because it just helps prevent further spasm and perhaps a unnecessary trip to the emergency room. Uh, we talked briefly about cervical disc herniation. Um, sometimes again, if there's a sudden jolt and if the symptoms are too exaggerated, then we will CAT scan patients who have a potential disc herniation. Um, I mean, in and of itself, it's not dangerous as long as there's no uh, significant weakness or significant injury to the spinal cord, which is very rare. So even sometimes patients who have a clinical diagnosis of a disc herniation, if they're clinically stable, they may not need emergent or urgent imaging, and they can wait maybe a, 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 few, a few days or a week for that MRI as per their primary care physician. Um, okay, so I think with this, I think we've finished the talk and I was going a mile a minute. Appreciate so much your patience. 